Welcome back, Tributes, to episode 48 of Into the Arena. I'm Holly. And I'm Emily. And today we have a very exciting guest to talk with. Yes. But before we dive in, some announcements. Tribute Talk tomorrow, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern time, like always, be there. <laughs> <laughs> we are reading chapters 15 and 16 of Mockingjay with all of our friends, so come stop by for that. And... Our biggest announcement is that Brian is here. Brian, you may know them as Panem underscore archives on Instagram. So mm -hmm. we are so excited to have you. Before we get into our discussion with you, though, we have some rapid fire questions for you. <laughs> are you ready for I'm them? Ready. Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Favorite Hunger Games book? <laughs> it would have to be the first one, The Hunger Games. Yes. Good choice. Favorite Hunger Games movie? Very easy one, Catching Fire. Yes, yes. Favorite Hunger Games character? Katniss. I relate to her really easily. If you can't pick Katniss, who is your other favorite character, side character? Probably not the most popular opinion, but probably Gale. Gale, okay. Oh, all right. Yeah. Gale representation right here. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Not the Gale Hay Club. Gale needs some love though. Oh, so this true. is this is good for the pod. <laughs> yeah, we we need some representation here. What is your favorite memory from your time in the Hunger Games fandom? I think what I really love the most is just the feeling in the movie theaters, just waiting to see how everything comes together. Just seeing set photos and hearing of things and just seeing it all come together on screen, I think is the most memorable part and most exciting part mm -hmm. i love that if you could have a spin-off book or movie about anything in the panem universe what would it be about i would really want what i was hoping the new book was going to be about i want a story about the dark days sort of like the way um rogue one from star wars was done mm -hmm. like maybe from the perspective of the first rebels and you know how it wasn't successful I would really like to see a story like that. That's a really good idea. Just something totally different. But, mm -hmm. but that possibility is still there. Prequel of a prequel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, and then this is controversial. Are pita's cheese buns savory or sweet? I would have to say possibly both. Oh, that's such a safe answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, you gotta choose a side. <laughs> well, the way I'm imagining it is possibly, I don't know if you guys know the restaurant Jim and Nick's, mm -mm. but they have these cheese muffins, I think they call them. I don't know. But I, back okay. in Tennessee, I would have them all the time. And that's how I imagine possibly them being. Okay, we're going to have to look this up. Yeah. <laughs> Do some research on these I can kind of see that though, like a combo, like a, a muffin. So it's like sort yeah. of both. Maybe yes. that'll be the answer to end the feud. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> the fandom feud. <laughs> well, those are our rapid fire questions. I didn't even address this because when we logged on to the Zoom, like obviously Emily and I were freaking out about it, but your background it looks amazing. If you're watching, you're seeing this and you're probably going crazy over it. It looks amazing. Brian's visuals are always amazing. Like mm -hmm. your Instagram account, I'm just obsessed with it. It's so cool. Like just the way everything looks so stylized and I, I just love how it looks going to your page and, and seeing all of the things that you own in your collection it's just and you have so much knowledge too mm -hmm. like I've just wanted to have you on for so long because I feel like you really are Panem's archivist like your Instagram says you just like know so much mm -hmm. yeah I with, with the Instagram I always wanted to do something with the fandom in an Instagram because I, I started out with my personal page and I would just post stuff about the Hunger Games. And then this was back in 2012. And I would always get friends just saying, stop posting so much Hunger Games stuff. It's <laughs> blowing up my feed. <laughs> and so then I just, I pulled back and then the whole series went through the first four movies. And I thought, you know, now I missed my chance. But then this new book came out and I talked to a few friends and they're like, yeah, do it. So I finally did mm -hmm. it and I really enjoy it. I love that people are still in the fandom, like creating new accounts and, and starting new things still. I mean, like us, we started this podcast. You've got like your Instagram. I think AJ started their Instagram. I mean, after all the movies came out, it's cool to see that there's still 
enough like interest and like people who are passionate enough to to do things in the fandom still so I love that yeah I think people always put an age range on especially like YA trilogies or stories yes. mm. and so it's really nice to see other people who are who were young younger when the movies came out or when the books came out and they're still they still have a passion for it so I would like to ask you because I don't think I really know this and I don't, I don't think you've posted too much on your Instagram but like what is your Hunger Games fandom story like how did you first encounter the mm-hmm. books or the movies how how did you become a Hunger Games fan so going way back in time I always heard about like what a trilogies and I was like I don't know what that's about I wasn't a really big book reader mm-hmm. I'm I'm a visual and audio person so I really love music and I really love movies because I love all the effort that goes into it. But I never really read a lot of books because I need to see something or hear something. And so The Hunger Games was really my first YA series to get into. And I remember one of my friends and her mom always talking about The Hunger Games. I would hear bits and pieces and then they said something about survival or it's a survival story. So my mind automatically went to one of those, you know, cliche plane crash stories where children are on the plane and although the adults are gone and they have to figure out how to survive. And that's what my first impression of The Hunger Games was. And then the trailer came out and I was really interested. And then I was at Sam's Club with my family one time and I saw the book and it was on sale for like $5. I asked if I could get the book. And so I got the book. Before we even left the store, I had already read the first chapter and I was instantly hooked. Yeah. That's how it started. Love that. <laughs> you mentioned your interest in music in the fandom. What is your favorite score from any of the soundtracks? And do you have a favorite track? I always think about it and it's very hard to rank them, but I think I would have to go with Catching Fire just because after the first film, I had a lot of uh, things in my head on how the movie should look and how the movie should sound, especially with James Newton Howard. I wanted the score to sound more like The Village with like a very powerful violin sound. And he kind of did that. Um, He did with it with a fiddle style. And so I really enjoyed that. And so Catching Fire became my favorite one. Then for a specific piece, my absolute favorite is Arena Crumbles. Ooh, mm. that's, that's good. One. There's a lot of good ones in Catching Fire. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All the pieces that have that theme that's in Arena Crumbles, they're really my favorites. You know, starting with I Had to Do That, then Katniss is Chosen, and then Arena Crumbles. Just, I really love that vocal work that he did, that piece. It's just so eerie whenever you listen to it. Always gives me chills. Epic. <laughs> all, all of his music is epic what are we talking about yeah. do you play any other instruments besides piano musically I started off with the tuba that was in middle school and then in one of the books that we had it had the keys on a piano labeled and so from there I took that started learning notes on the keys and then just taught myself piano And I've tried to do other instruments. I've given violin a try just to try and play some pieces from The Hunger Games. And it hasn't really stuck. So right now it's just mostly just piano. You do the organ a little bit. I love the posts that you're posting on your Instagram of the clips from The Hunger Games movies. And then you're playing the piano. Like I just, Mm -hmm. I think it's it's so cool. The talent. Because I feel like in this fandom, there's so many creative people. But I feel like... Right now, you're the big musical aspect of the fandom, like in terms of what people are producing and content that is being created. So that's really exciting. And I'm excited for the ballad score to come out for you to get to do that all over again. It'll be so fun. Although I'm still waiting for a p- official piano book from Monk and mm-hmm. G Part 1 and 2. We never got those. I feel like there's so many things from Mock and J Part 1 and Part 2 that we just never got they yeah. just stopped with everything they're just like oh well here's all the merch about us. <laughs> soundtrack you don't get anything yeah. else <laughs> I, I think they were trying to get divergent 
more on its feet. Really and mm-hmm. so I think that's a good point. Like, they like it enough. I think we can try and help our other properties. And so if you really look at it, there still is a lot, especially with the viral marketing for like the district voices and the capital TV, which I thought was really cool. But then it also plays with the story where information put out is restricted. And so <laughs> they restricted the promotion for the movie. So you only see specific things if you want to look at it that way. So. <laughs> that helps a little maybe <laughs> <laughs> yeah you have so many cool and like unique talents that like you bring to the fandom that like other people like aren't aren't doing just like music and then everything with costume design and the costumes I feel like you're really like a wealth of knowledge in mm-hmm. that area so you started music before you were into the Hunger Games playing piano and everything but costume design is that something you were into before the Hunger Games uh, or is that something that like came from your love of that and it came from Catching Fire uh when I growing up I always thought going into a profession I didn't really know what to choose I was always doing art, then science, then just going all over the place. So then I stuck with music, and James Newton Howard has been my favorite for a long time. He did the scores for my three favorite Disney movies, um, Dinosaur, Atlantis, and Treasure Planet. Always with music, it was he was always there. Um, but the costuming and fashion did not happen until Catching Fire with Trisha Marvel's work. She really got me into looking at different designers, seeing how you could put them together. And then I started creating my own stuff. And my first fashion project was making my own Katniss cowl. Oh, wow. And oh, cool. From there, I just became obsessed with how to take clothes apart, put them together. Um, and growing up, my mom, she taught me how to sew. She taught me how to knit, but just basic stuff. Just, you know, just in case anything I needed anything and so then I started looking back on those skills that I learned and then I just expanded it looking up YouTube videos and then I did study for a little bit at um, a university doing apparel design but it wasn't really a good fit with me I was too creative for them and (laughs) we clashed a lot and I had to I had to leave you needed to be on like Project Runway or something like that (laughs) well they did have a girl there um, who was on Project Runway, <laughs> and they put her on a pedestal, and mm. they say she's the best, and then Ooh. they really don't <laughs> like you at my university. They really yeah. did not support you until you were successful. Then they mm. would take the credit, like, oh, they're successful because of what we taught them. Ugh, so, gross. Yeah, I had sort of like a uh, Cruella relationship <laughs> with my <laughs> university. They only liked what I produced when it was beneficial for them. And when it wasn't, they're like, okay, you can go now. Rude. And now look at you making Lucy Gray's amazing rainbow dress, which I'm obsessed with. Me too. I love your interpretation of it because that's how I saw it as well. I mean, who knows what they're going to do for the film, but I really saw it as a more understated rainbow with like different yeah. colored patterns and everything. So I, I loved seeing your, your concept. That's what I saw too. Cause right when they say rainbow, you automatically think like a literal rainbow, but you always need texture and story within a costume. My first initial design was using only solid colors, but it all blending together into like a feathering motion to look like a bird because I wanted to go with a Mm. a bird imagery um, since she you know it sort of alludes to mocking jays and jabber jays and the relationship how that's actually the capital in the districts but then my personal design was just too capital style I I think I designed more like a capital citizen (laughs) and so I decided to look more into different styles within like the Appalachian culture. And since I came from Tennessee, that I call Tennessee home. I'm from Gallup, New Mexico, but I call Tennessee home. So I started looking at the fashion throughout the years there. And I was really inspired by the Civil War and Mm -hmm. like all the textured prints that they have back then. And so then I altered the design and eventually came up with I what is now finished I have a finished piece now it's amazing like I think back to what we're talking about you're contributing to the fandom in a way that no one else is right now because 
people are drawing their and painting their own renditions of Lucy Gray's dress. But to physically see a, an actual costume, mm-hmm. I don't think you understand how awesome that is for yeah. us. Bringing something to life when we <laughs> don't, artistic. you know, we don't have the movie yet. We we're not seeing yeah. anything. So mm-hmm. seeing something yeah, I was like tactile. Really nervous. Would I be able to finish it with the move all the way out here to Utah? Um, would I be able to finish it in time and get it out there? before we see images from the film. That's the fun part. Like we talk about all the time before the movie comes out and before we see these things like the red skirts, <laughs> we have no idea what we're gonna see on screen. So <laughs> yeah. it's nice but to see. I, I trust Tristan Mobile, so. Yes, there's trust there for sure. So what are mm-hmm. your favorite costumes in the series? I think my favorite costumes are the ones that are designed by Cinna. Each costume designer had to design it through the eyes of him and not their own Mm. personal style. Because if you look at a lot of the concept art for some, like especially the Mockingjay suit, it's more sculptural. There are a lot more details. But then Francis told Kurt and Bart, the costume designers, to tone it back a little bit because it's Cinna. He's a very simple but elegant man. And so I I like seeing the costumes that are designed through another character in the story and how it's not as elaborate as we think it is. I think my favorite one is the Mockingjay dress because I think a lot of people, you know, in the book it says there's feathers. And so a lot of people will imagine this huge ball gown, but it's a really simple silhouette and it's printed, but it has these metallic layers underneath that catch the light. And so... I think that one would be my favorite. And then the chariot dress, just because of the details in it and how it was brought to life in the movie and more than just the simple like leotard, how Mm -hmm. it is in the book. That's so interesting to think about through a character's eyes. I'd never see, I I know nothing about fashion or anything (laughs) about costume design or anything. And so to hear somebody who has that knowledge say a comment like that now, Every time I'm going to watch Cinna outfit scenes, I'm going to think that we're looking through Cinna's eyes. So that's so fascinating. Those are two costumes that I would really like to see in person. I haven't been to the exhibition, but from looking at photos and stuff that there's a lot of detail in those costumes Mm -hmm. that you just don't really see in the film. I don't dislike those costumes, but I think really seeing those in person would give me more of an appreciation for them so I would just I'd love to see them in person yeah I think especially with the um the chariot dress everyone thinks it's black but when you see it in person it's a laser cut lamb leather and it's actually has a brown tint to it and then there's a gold metallic fabric underneath again with the light it moves and has a really nice quality to it it definitely looks black to me Mm -hmm. (laughs) in the film so yeah, I would love to see all all the details of the costuming up close. Five hours from the exhibition, so I'm planning on going sometime again. I do too, but <laughs> I still haven't <laughs> made it there. I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> I need to get there. There's gonna it's gonna come one day where they're like, oh, we're closing it down. I'll be like, I haven't been. I need to go. Right. Like- it was near me in Tennessee, in Kentucky, and it was only three hours mm-hmm. away, and I kept trying to make plans to go but I never made it there it took a pause and then I thought Mm. I lost my chance to see it again but then the Las Vegas one showed up I didn't realize it was in Kentucky it's so interesting Mm. Chase should have gone yeah (laughs) 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 just hearing you talk so positively about an outfit I want to hear you bash your least favorite yeah there's there's got to be an outfit that you (laughs) hate all right here we go (laughs) um (laughs) My least favorite, it's really a collective, is the costume design for the entire capital of the first film. Mm, I really don't like the satin saturation. Everything is just satin, 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 and really puffy satin. And I do like, you know, shape in a garment, but I didn't like how they all looked uniform. And I understand that, you know, there's a budget and maybe that's what they look, they were going for, but I just think it should have been better and showing more print texture, like with Trish Somerville, mm. each capital citizen was so 
individually made. For me, I've seen the movies a lot. I see repeats of the of certain capital characters like, oh, I've seen them in like five other scenes because they've only got those few costumes. But within Catching Fire, it was, you see someone new every time. So I really yeah. didn't like the capital design in the first film. A few of Effie's costumes I didn't like. I think they should have been better. Um, Ooh, which ones? I, I really, <laughs> I don't like her reaping costume for the first film. Really? Yeah. What I is like it about the, it that, that you don't like? I think it's just... It looks kind of like a business outfit a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And I love the color though. Yeah, I think the color would have been good. I think it's just a different silhouette because I, like you said, it looked very businessy and it's more like a maybe 70s look. And that's an era that I don't like. Like 70s, 80s, and 90s, I really do not like. And so it looked like that to me. And so I really didn't like that. Plus, looking at the behind the scenes uh, clips, they were always saying they didn't want to make her stand out too much. They didn't want her to look like a clown in District 12. They didn't want her. <laughs> they kept on saying we didn't want it be to be too weird. But then Trish Somerville came along and she's in an Alexander McQueen butterfly dress in District 12. Right. And she looks amazing. So I think they were too worried on don't make it look too weird that they should have just took in the freedom and designed it better. I get what you're saying about like the Capitol as a collective too for the first film. I, I haven't noticed like similar outfits or like the same outfit. But it did seem like, like, obviously there's a different budget and a different idea of what yeah. the movie would be. But it does seem like they kind of just like put a bow on somebody or did this with somebody and just- <laughs> Black outfit them. with a pop of color that's set. <laughs> Bleach dogs. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I agree. If they had just done different colors or different patterns, I feel like that could have elevated it and not made it feel so clownish. I think that's what it looks like to me too. A bunch of clowns because of the pops and yeah there are some like rough full collars in there too so it kind of gives that look I do like a lot of the shapes of the outfits and like some of their like head pieces and like mm -hmm. the puffiness to it like I like that so yeah I can totally see what you mean I do have one favorite costume of a capital citizen you see it in one of the steals one woman she's got it is satin a black satin top with puff shoulders and one like a red fan looking kind of thing oh on her head. i know which one you're talking about yeah yeah I, that's the one costume that i do like you own a few pieces from the actual movies just a few like yeah <laughs> see behind see yeah. the background yeah. which is just crazy to me do you want to dive in a little bit to how you started collecting costumes yeah and that process i heard about the black sparrow auction maybe a year after it happened because i was just getting into the fashion and costume design with the second movie and then i looked through all the lots and saw like oh this i could have had this but um rip <laughs> me every day and of then, my life <laughs> then then i had also found out that a lot of it that didn't sell went to theme park connections which they do a lot of stuff with disney and that was down in Florida. People bought stuff from that auction and then, you know, it filtered into eBay. My first costume that I got was a pair of tribute pants. I think it was <laughs> the District 10 boy pants. From there, I just kept looking on eBay. My first major one was from the second World of the Hunger Games auction where I got the male AVOX costumes. And then from there it grew more and more, just finding pieces here and there. When it really grew, in Tennessee I lived about three hours away from Atlanta and mm -hmm. the filming had stopped and the movies had already come out. Was, I think it was about one or two years after the final film had come out. I was just on Facebook. I saw that there was this group called Clothes From Shows that was having a sale and they had just a whole bunch of costumes from the films and they were really cheap. I got an entire, well, not an entire District 13 soldier costume for 60 bucks. 
Are you kidding? I can't. <laughs> this is hurting. And, yeah. And so I, when I heard about the sale, I had been messaging them because they had, I guess, a smaller one before. And I was trying to see if they still had pieces left over. And so then they messaged me and they said, we're having another sale. And so I drove there about three in the morning, uh, got there around six, and then the sale started at seven. And so I I was in there and I was in a huge warehouse and everything was mixed together. You had to go through, they sort of had it sectioned off like District 13. I just looked through everything, looked for sizes that I could get. I spent about $200 and got a total of 12 costumes. So that was a, that was a big Wait. chunk. And, <laughs> and so, yeah, just looking through and then I found like actual pieces like Effie's costumes, Gail's costumes, and it was all just mixed in there. You just had to look at the, oh the labeling gosh. on the costumes. That's incredible. Um, that sounds like a dream, like a literal dream. Yeah, my heaven. Just, <laughs> just going I, through I've, bins of Hunger Games costumes. I've, I've spent, after that, I spent some restless nights just thinking I should have grabbed that, I should have grabbed that, and, mm. and then realizing what I saw and like, oh my gosh, that was there, I should have grabbed that. And it just, it really plagued my mind and how... I, things I should have gotten um, but then they had another sale I think the following year and it was just the remainder of the district 13 uniforms and stuff like that the uniforms as in like the jumpsuits and button-ups just the civilian clothes and then it was even more cheap it was I think the button-ups were three dollars or no okay it was three <laughs> items for five dollars <laughs> This hurts. I just paid, I think, one of the District 13, like, button-ups, 60 bucks. I was happy with that, but, yeah, <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah. I'm glad that I was able to get what I could, and then from there, I've just been searching eBay and stuff, because people think I'm I'm a millionaire, and I have a whole bunch of money, and now I just, I was able yeah, to find them at really good prices. things went for really cheap, like, even... Yeah. It just makes me mad. The Blacksboro auction. I don't know why I didn't buy any. I guess I was I was a poor college student then, so <laughs> I just like sat there and cried watching <laughs> all the things <laughs> being sold. But yeah, although yeah. with those auctions, there are a lot of hidden fees. True. Well, they're not hidden, right. but there there's a lot that adds to the price. Because when I bought the male Avox costumes from the Profiles in History auction, um, it was two hundred dollars. And then there was a buyer's premium, which is just like a fee. And that was, I think, 23%. And then shipping, you had to go through a third party person. And that was another $60 or something. And so the total was like three something. Yeah, it really can add up with auction houses. But yeah. I mean, still, the prices then compared to what they would be listed for today i feel like it's astronomically different <laughs> yeah you do get some people who who have pieces and they try to sell them and they sell them for a lot higher now but they do sit there for a while i bought a couple years ago effie's alternate reaping shoes from the black sparrow auction and i think that was sitting on ebay for a super long time i paid a ridiculous yeah. amount of money for it it's like not even seen in the movie but there is a picture of elizabeth banks wearing them and it's funny yeah. on the bottom they have um some gray like cement still underneath so you can see like that was the the color of like the stage that they yeah. were standing on mm -hmm. but what i really wanted it for is because i just wanted to have something from that auction and then have one of the little like certificate of authenticities from that auction which i just think is really yeah. cool to have yeah the only thing i have from a black sparrow auction is a garment bag that has the logo on it and says the hunger games auction everything else i got was from private collectors i've gotten a few things from i think probably the same person that you got like i see behind you the the panem seal i got one of those too i'm assuming you got yours off ebay oh yeah yeah I, and I then think I, you got I, some posters and i got some posters too from mockingjay yeah. i think that was from the same person which those were pretty cheap i think yeah 
So people still like will sell things because maybe they don't know what they have or they just mm-hmm. want to get rid of it and don't want to go through the hassle of like the auction house or whatever. So I think it's still possible to find things. It's just few and far between and you have to really yeah. stay on top of looking. Yeah, I just I just constantly I have I have a setting on eBay. Anything Hunger Games I can see and go through. Every now and then I see a piece that shows up. Holly, you got it. You got to get something. (laughs) I know. I'm just sitting there like, oh, what I would give. See, when the movies came out for me, I was 12. So I didn't really get any participation in (laughs) buying things. Is there anything, Brian, that you're like just dying to have, you're like really looking for, or just like a dream item that you don't think you could ever afford, but that you would, you would pick that you'd want to own? I think the item that I would really want is the Mockingjay suit with like oh, the bow yeah. and quiver and all yeah, of it cool. i think if it came down to it i would trade my entire collection just wow. for the mocking jay suit because i really like wow. it. that's a statement that's a statement yeah. what about the red mocking jay suit would you take that one or do we not like that um i like it for the aspect of um having promotional difference um and i guess there is there is sort of a biblical symbolism to it because like in the bible it says when jesus comes again he'll be in red and so Mm. part two you know she's more katniss is more vengeful she's on a mission she has less mercy wow and so she appears in red and so i i don't know if they decided to go with that sort of that biblical symbolism but I do like the suit for that, but I want to trade my whole collection for the red suit. <laughs> well, okay, just, just had to clarify. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but now you get to bring all your costumes and outfits to events. Like you've been to Onset Cinema. I wasn't there for no. Onset Cinema, but how has that been getting to share with the fandom? I think that's so cool that you get to do that. Mm-hmm. When I first heard about the event, I was planning on just going as you know, another attendee, but then I decided, you know, I'm sure fans would love to see pieces. And so then I reached out to Kenny and I said, hey, I have pieces. Um, I can bring them if you would like to have a display. And so then I had a few pieces that I brought set up. It's really hot in that Katniss house. (laughs) Um, The fact that you got to set it up in Katniss's house, though, I don't like it's just so cool. I really like that because seeing the pieces in a place where it was filmed is a really cool experience Um, instead of just seeing it in a very distant museum or exhibition, seeing the costumes in a place where the story actually took place is really cool. It's so awesome because it's hard for like Emily and I talk about this all the time. The Hunger Games fandom doesn't really have a specific location where fans can like get together and like have events besides what Onset Cinema is doing. And so for you to be able to like bring that to people and show fans actual costume, costuming is just so cool. And it's so like, it's so selfless of you to just like be like, yeah, instead of taking the easy way, I'm just gonna go and hang out and see the movie. Like you brought, you lugged all that stuff out. It's just so cool. It's very nerve wracking when I load everything into yes. the U-Haul trailer that I get. <laughs> I don't I think I could. Travel, <laughs> I have to travel across the mountains from Tennessee to North oh. Carolina. And it's very windy and steep. And I, I get very nervous getting there and having enough time to set up. Because every time I've gone there, I've planned ahead and tried to have enough time to set up. But I'm always, every time I set up, I'm going setting up 15 to 30 minutes into the event because mm. I Kenny comes in and he's like are you ready and I'm like I'm almost I have a few more <laughs> you were just like rushing around trying to try to finish everything but yeah it was awesome the only ones that I have pre-dressed are the peacekeeper costumes because the boots are a pain to get on and so I they, they have been dressed since the first or second event I'm hoping we can do another one Um, but then this time it will be even more risky because I have to bring them all the way across the country Mm -hmm. from Utah. That's a long way. I think he said if we're going to do another one, it may be in the fall of next year, Mm. just so that way there's enough time to build up um, people coming because he, he was on the verge of canceling the last event because there wasn't enough ticket sales. If we do another one, we're hoping for the fall, 
and I have suggested to him possibly doing one in Atlanta for yeah. the Catching Fire that'd be really anniversary. cool mm -hmm. and See, then I, I mean I the lead up that. to <laughs> Ballad because Ballad's coming out next fall so hopefully there'd be a lot yeah. of interest from people who maybe mm -hmm. have even like stepped away and haven't been as interested in coming to something like that and it'd be in a more easy place to get to than driving all the way out to Hickory yeah it is kind of in the middle of nowhere yeah. <laughs> I mean amazing. I enjoyed going there though as someone who mm -hmm. had never been there before and and seen you know district 12 we were looking at places and it's very hard to find a place because then the place wants to charge and yeah they have their own stipulations of what you can do there. I have suggested that we do a Mockingjay Part 1 screening, but at where the quarry location is, where, they, where she sings the hanging tree. Mm. Um, but that is a public park, and he said usually anything with a public park, it has to be free. Other places I was thinking about was the, the goat farm, where they filmed the District 12 Square. That's an artist community, and they're they're very picky like if you go there and just take pictures they will stop you and ask you if you paid for the allotted time to take pictures there they oh. even have signs everywhere saying do not take photos mm -hmm. here people live there I, i'm pretty sure so there's that you have to deal with and then i think another place i was thinking of was lease one house but that may be really expensive. That grassy lawn area there, mm -hmm. to do it there. I, I feel like there could be a way to incentivize, like, well, we'll have all these people come and they'll pay to go on a tour through the Swan House or, or something, yeah. you know? I mean, they did have, for a while, they had capital tours at right, the Swan yeah. House. I was able to go to that one time um, and they had a room on the second floor just full of stuff from production. And then one day I went back and asked if they still had that and they said no, because Lionsgate didn't renew a contract with them. So everything got moved out. Dang. Where as Hunger Games fans, mm -hmm. like, do we go? <laughs> yeah, we need a place, um, a mm -hmm. time and a place yeah. and we'll be there. <laughs> it would be so cool if they started like an actual museum mm -hmm. at Henry River Mill Village with Hunger Games things. I, I think that would be I, so I, cool. I, I was talking to the owner. Um, I was talking to him mm -hmm. one time because he was telling me his plans. They are planning on renovating all the houses and they are going to completely re redo Katniss's house as sort of as the way it, the new one is. Um, you guys stayed there, right? We um, did stay the there in the house. renovated cabin. So they're planning yeah. on renovating it to that level, Katniss's house? Yeah, and then that will be the museum area. I don't know so how I feel will... about that. <laughs> yeah, I I was hoping that they would keep the house the way it is for the historical aspect of the movie, but they are planning on completely re redoing that entire house. Mm -hmm. um, but they said the timeline for that before they even get to Katniss's house is probably 18 years. Oh my so gosh. You, so <laughs> That's we, some time. You do have, okay. have some time. <laughs> I feel like the first thing they should do is renovate the general store or the bakery. Make that so that you can go inside, turn it into some sort of cafe or restaurant, and maybe have a small yeah. museum section in there. Like, Because people would love to be able to go inside. I think that'd be so cool. I've been inside there uh, when I was trying to hang the, uh, the Capitol flag from the bakery. Mm -hmm. um, it's falling apart uh the floors are very uneven yeah and, um and that's the reason why i didn't hang the flag the other times is because uh i can't remember his name the owner um but he said that it's not safe to have people in there right now so they're trying mm -hmm. to limit the people in there um but when the village was for sale a couple years ago my mom and i we we fantasized about buying it and just like you said, we had plans to like make the general store a cafe and then on the top level, having my costume collection on display up there. Oh my gosh, how cool would that have been? Maybe That's some Hunger Games fans should have <laughs> <laughs> got together and yeah. <laughs> made something happen. But I mean, I feel like the, like the renovated cabin, like they're doing a really cool 
job at that and it was cool to be able to stay there and like all the work that they put in and pulling different like historical pieces like together to highlight in in the cabin like they took pieces like things that were from the general store and put it in there and just like the history we kind of got a tour of it and it was really cool like how they put it together I like that they do that someone is saving a piece of you know cinematic history but also for actual history um Mm -hmm. I just wish it was more for the cinematic history (laughs) yeah right yeah Yeah. oh I kind of wanted to talk about so you're an archer too like you're into archery right so cool like this is like another like talent let's add it to the list (laughs) (laughs) so I mean is that something that you got into because of the Hunger Games how long have you been doing that I've been doing archery for a very long time uh, since I was little but I never really had my own equipment it was always like summer camps where they have the equipment available and then I would just spend most of my time there. And I didn't really have an established personal archery style until the Hunger Games. Mostly my own experience with archery was, you know, the compound bow, you know, the ones with the wheels on the top and bottom. Mm. And I really didn't like that style um, because it was too mechanized for me. Um, I guess that's my Native American side coming out once I started getting more in traditional archery um, off the shelf bows and stuff like that I really got into a good rhythm with that and that became better for me then I found out when I was in high school that my school had an archery team and so then I got with that and I just took off from there and the Hunger Games has made it more fun absolutely I remember going to like camp out here after like grading the Hunger Games, seeing the Hunger Games, and me being like, take me to the archery area. I'm Katniss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, my personal equipment is um, the catching fire bow, the Hoyt Buffalo. What? That's mm. so cool. Stop. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I have so it right here. Let's see. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Pull it out. <laughs> Show it out. Um, awesome. I think what most people think is that the bow is a single piece, like a traditional longbow. But it's actually a takedown bow. So here's the riser. Learning new vocabulary here. (laughs) Yeah. I painted it to look like the catching fire bow. Um, Some of the paint is coming off. And then you have the limbs, which I also detailed to look like catching fire with the carbon fiber. So then there's two pieces like that. Yeah. And then you just walk them in like that. This and is this so is a cool. takedown bow, so it's like easier for storage and travel. Okay. And then you just string it. And then my personal arrows that I use, I made a quiver to look like Katniss's quiver in Catching Fire. Whoa. And then these Amazing. are the Easton arrows. And then the difference between the movie and the ones that I use are that these are feather fletchings. Um, mm. That's actually more preferred than the plastic ones you see in the movie um, because when the arrow goes over the riser, they compress. So that way gotcha. it doesn't sort of veer off. The plastic um, ones just look cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was more for aesthetics. But I think I think they should have used feather anyways, because as you can see, you can get feather fletchings that look exactly the way the movie does. How much does a set, like all of that, like how much would that cost? So I found this Hoyt Buffalo on eBay for about $400. Okay. And the new one goes Ooh. for about 800 And then you have to look into draw weights when you pull back the bow. How heavy is it? Um, and if you're a new person, you should start off with a lower one. But since I've been doing archery for a long time, I was comfortable with just getting a bow that was the lowest price. And so this was the lowest price. And so my draw weight, my personal draw weight is on this one is 55 pounds, which could be really, really heavy for someone. But for me, I've trained my... Um, muscles to be able to draw that and hold an aiming pose. If you're starting archery, you should start anywhere between like 15 and 20 pounds. Oh that's gosh. also what that's I have to be like five use. pounds. Yeah, one pound. <laughs> I remember I tried archery once and I could barely like pull it back. I was like, I'm going to be Katniss. This is so cool. And I was like, mm, <laughs> nope, this is not for me. <laughs> There's also a stigma with archery, especially with men. Within archery is like if you don't pull a high draw weight you're not a real man 
and I really don't like that. So if you're starting archery, do yourself a favor, start with a lower draw weight. And if you want to work up to a higher draw weight, cause like me personally, I would like to go hunting and do all that kind of stuff with archery. And so with hunting, you have to have a 45 draw weight or higher. That's mm-hmm. just so that the animal does die quickly and your the animal's not in pain. Cause if you go like after an animal with a toy bow, you're not gonna get much done. Oh, that's so yeah. cool. It's just a whole like side of the Hunger Games like that I don't really know <laughs> anything about. <laughs> yeah. Cat, now she's, she should be out there with a 45 pound draw weight or higher. The mm-hmm. scenes that you've seen in the movie, since, I mean, you know, archery, does it, does it look right to an archer? Is it like an accurate portrayal? I think in the first film, most of it isn't right, especially, I think the one that bugs me the most is the the feast scene mm. where she rapid fires at Clove and it's not done right. The way she does it is she has the arrow and she just goes like that. I mean, the arrow is CG, so she's just doing the motion, but she's just putting it forward to where if you can see like, there's that shelf right here Mm -hmm. that's on the arrows on the wrong side but you know cg they just put up there automatically um and that's the thing that bugs me the most is her rapid fire in the first film on the second film they fixed that and they actually you actually see her when she draws she goes she has the bow canted a little bit and she goes on the opposite side and then pulls back so with the second and third and fourth film the archery does look a lot more real you have to train yourself a lot to be able to rapid fire that way the rapid fire is what you have to work on and you have to make that look real instead of it obviously looking cg and enhanced the way i would say in like the avengers with hawkeye i think that one that one bugs me the most of how it doesn't look real because you see the arrow it's got a gliding motion that an actual era wouldn't have. But I think with the last films, they did a really good job of making it more realistic and they had her practice more um, so that she could get the motion right. Well, it's so interesting, interesting to even think of that from the perspective of Katniss, like not even Jen practicing, but like going into the arena is the rapid fire style. Is that something that Katniss would even be able to do or something that she would have had to do in the woods, you know? I think she would. Because especially like in Catching Fire, when she's in the woods, she says she's distracted that she wouldn't be able, if a pack of wild dogs were to attack her, she wouldn't, you know, be in the right mind space at the moment to defend herself. So I think she would know how to rapid fire just in case anything in the woods Mm. was ready to attack her. I think she has that mentality, but then it got altered when she had to actually use it for combat. And so then she, you see it. A lot more smoothly and catching fire so cool see th- these are things that i don't have the perspective <laughs> that i wouldn't have you known. know i'm like thinking of questions that i didn't even something i didn't even think to think of one other thing that bugs me is that um she only has a glove in the first film when she's hunting and in her mockingjay costume i understand that you know having a glove on the entire time doesn't really work but you should always have an archery glove or tab when shooting because the string on your fingers um, if you have that constantly like that you can do permanent nerve damage to your fingers i feel like the arena makes sense because yeah it just might not have been provided so she had to make do but yeah for other scenes that's that's weird when she had it hunting and with the mockingjay suit yeah and especially if, like, within the story, she's doing a high draw weight, her fingers would be hurting. Um, but I think for filming, they got, they had rubber limbs made. So it was more like a mm. 20, 15 pound draw weight. So that way she can hold it for a long time mm. while filming. And then she could also dry fire, which is firing without an arrow. Because if you do that with a regular bow, the momentum is transferred with the arrow. So all that energy leaves when, leaves the bow with the arrow but if you don't have the arrow in it all that energy stays in and that vibrates the entire bow and you can the bow can explode on you oh my gosh yeah (laughs) wow i didn't realize that the um 
arrows in the first movie were also CGI. I thought that was all like practical for some reason, and I thought it was only CGI, like because the budget was bigger later. But it's interesting mm. to know that they made mistakes with the CGI in the first film. When she's shooting the pile of supplies, that's done practically. But with the second one, since the camera work is a little more different, it's not just her standing in one place. And then she shoots because then they can make sure no one is downrange. Right. But with Catching Fire, with the action being different and Mocking J Part 1 and 2, with the action being different, there needs to be safety for the crew as well as the actor themselves. And so mm-hmm. it's CG. But a lot of the first film was practical shooting just as long as it wasn't towards anyone. Like in the hunting scenes, they... If you look in the behind the scenes, she is firing an arrow. Last kind of discussion point, talking about Ballad. Were you excited when you found out what Ballad was going to be about? And did you like the book? I went a little back and forth, but Susan Collins, she has more story to tell. And so I'm pretty sure that there was going to be a purpose to the story. Not like sort of like how Disney films are, where like, oh, we want you to not think of this character as a bad character anymore but as just misunderstood Mm -hmm. and I don't think she did that with the the book in my initial review of the book it was that you feel the same but different about Snow Mm -hmm. you still don't like him but you just you know more about him Mm -hmm. um and I did I really did like the book I like the structure of how the games was built and how it wasn't the same as we see in like the 74th Hunger Games. Of course, having costumes be so prevalent within the story again. Yeah. Really yeah. Like that. It's Especially very from the, the capital side too. I mean, I guess we Katniss talks about capital costumes like with Effie and, and stuff too, but I don't know, just kind of a different perspective and like being in the capital so much that was really interesting but yeah costumes for sure yeah how are you feeling about Uh, the costumes that we've seen so far that's that's what I want to know like (laughs) I mean I know you've said that you trust Trish Somerville who is Mm -hmm. returning for the costumes but like you've got to have some sort of thoughts about like how you're feeling from what we've seen of these set photos yeah so when I imagined the capital I sort of imagined it somewhat like how we see in Catching Fire and the other films. I imagined a very elegant, high fashion. Um, What I didn't expect was the sort of 40s World War look that they're they're Mm -hmm. going for with this new film, which is understandable because if you look at District 13 and sort of the first costumes of the first film, especially the Capitol, there is that historic 40s World War look within it. And so it makes sense that the story that we're getting into with the 10th Hunger Games would have a more of a historical look. I just didn't expect them to go so full on it looking like a period piece. It does look like a period piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, I didn't expect that at all either, but I'm liking it now that we're seeing it. I like the idea that all of Panem, like even the districts, might have dressed more similarly near like the end of the dark days and then the capital kind of goes in this total different trajectory that they're they completely go wild (laughs) (laughs) yeah i yeah in that sense i do i do like it and showing that especially like with katniss's line in mockingjay um she's she's telling people you know we're not different we're brothers we're all together and then you see that you know, they do dress similarly because they're together in the same time period. And then as time goes on, you just see them branch off from each other. Now that I've given myself time to know that they're going with a different aesthetic look, I'm sad that Phil Messina is not returning for production design. Mm. Um, Yeah, me too. But I kind of like that there is an old world look to it and it gives Pan Am its own history than what we just see in the movies that we've seen or what's described in the book. You start to see Pan Am in a historical context that it's been there for a long time. I do always tell people who maybe don't like the movie because of the way it's not really imagined and I always tell them in the credits it does say 
based on, not the literal transla- translation of. I'll have to remember that as I start to <laughs> digest valid information. <laughs> no, it's got to be right. It's got to be perfect. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, then it's a good point because people do take what the movie is as fact. And so it's a good piece of advice going forward with valid. So I like that. Yeah. I'm excited to see how it all unfolds. I'm just mm-hmm. I'm just happy again, like you said, to be back in the theater and seeing it and having that experience. I feel like we could just talk about things Everything for hours. With you. <laughs> like learning mm-hmm. so much about you and all your interests and how awesome of a person you are. Seriously, this fandom is so lucky to have you. Oh yeah, for sure. Thank you. Everyone go mm-hmm. follow Panum underscore archives on Instagram because yes. quality. Yes. If you're not following Brian, go follow Brian. You guys want to like a uh, quick sneak peek at the finished lucy gray costume uh yes, yes. <laughs> absolutely get, the exclusive a, y'all yeah i'm like is that <laughs> even a I question have, <laughs> i have on a dress form right now oh my goodness see, real Wheel quick. it in <laughs> whoa oh, oh my, my goodness. gosh i love the top and the belt yeah, and then then we have the skirt yeah no it gives me like mm-hmm. appalachian vibes it's so cool. I feel like the movie is going to have a very literal rainbow take, but I, I love how uh, like District 12 this feels, or like surrounding, just very districts yeah. that it feels. Yeah, and I went with um, the highlighted the three colors in the book. So we've got the raspberry pink, the royal blue, and then right here we've got the daffodil yellow. See, I feel like Snow would look at that and be like, oh, yeah, a rainbow of of colors, yeah. you know? Like, and then yeah. the with the puff sleeves, you get like sort of circus kind of colors. I did add for every, all the book accuracy, there are pockets hidden under the ruffles. Oh, nice. What? Gotta yes. have those pockets. <laughs> that is so cool. I can't get over that. That is amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. You get a yeah. first look right here into the arena (laughs) i have shoes ordered they should be arriving really soon um it took me a long time to find shoes to go with it and um i should be doing like sort of like a photo shoot how you see the costumes on my feed um really soon and then i'm also going to do a photo shoot with a friend who looks like the way i envisioned um lucy gray so so i found a look i found a location here in utah that Mm -hmm. sort of looks like district 12 and so I'm going to do that. And then I may go over to the Capitol building since I'm here in Salt Lake. Um, and it sort of gives an academy look to it. So I'm going to try and do a photo shoot there. So I'm, cool. I'm thinking I might uh, be a little over the top, but no. I may try and get some people to dress up as peacekeepers for me. For That's not shoot. too over, That's the not top. over the top. That is <laughs> perfection. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh wow, my so look out for that. Hopefully Sally. I can get all that and before any pictures of how the outfit looks gets released. More incentive for you to go follow Brian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like if you weren't yeah. already going to do it, go do it. It's been so great talking to you. Seriously. Thank you so much for joining us. Everyone go check Brian out, follow everything, like everything. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. We're so grateful to have you on here. Um, and I guess just to close out the show, Tribute Talk tomorrow. Join us for chapters 15 and 16 of Mockingjay. And we shall see you soon for another episode. See ya. Bye. Thanks for having me.